Hey guys, welcome back. We're on our fourth part of our series of David. And uh, behind me is one of the angels, uh, the three angels that are on the church wall at one of my churches here, Derrick City, here in Pennsylvania. And um, I'd just like to ask as you join with me uh, going on this journey, we're going to be looking at two chapters of David's life. We've looked at his anointing. We've looked at David and Goliath, and now we and then we've looked at David running from Saul as a fugitive, and we've marched down through some history, and um, up until this point, he's been running. He's been promised that he's been become king. But it's taken some time. This is 15, around 15 years of process where he's been promised you're going to be the next king. And then, well, let's read it. First Chronicles chapter 11 and verse, um, verse 3. Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel, according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. It says there that David was anointed king or, or became king there in, of Israel. This is what he would always wanted. Verse 9 says, So David went on and became great, and the Lord of the hosts was with him. David's finally king. Well, I want us to look at how he got there. And if you keep reading how he got there to be king, he didn't just go from a shepherd boy to becoming king. There's some things that happened there first. And if you read verse 10, it says, Now these were the heads of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him and his kingdom with all Israel, to make him king, according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. There were some people that got behind him and, and helped him become king. And these were called the mighty men. And there was a group of them. There was three main ones, and then there was a group of like 37. They were some valiant men. We would call them probably the Navy SEALs of today. And wow. Mighty men. And th they did some interesting things. I, I want us to look at verse 15. Now, three of the, ch three of the 30 chief men, 30, there's 30 here, and another place it says 37. Three of the chief men went down to the rock to David in the came, cave of Adullam, and the army of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Raphim. David was... Th then in the stronghold. And the garrison of the Philistines was then in, in Bethlehem. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. He says, Hey, I remember that water, man. That water is so good. Notice what happens. So the three broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. These were the kind of people that were these mighty men. They would just, let's go get some water for David. He wants some of that water. Let's, let's get through the army in the enemy camp. <laughs> and David, when he realized what he had asked, and they did. It says that he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O my God, that I should do this. Should, shall I drink the blood of these men who have put their lives in jeopardy? For at the risk of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. This is the kind of character that the three were, but, but also the 30 and the 37. The character of these mighty men was so uh, devoted to David 
They, they were with him in the thick and the thin. They were with him in these caves running from Saul. They didn't have to be there, but they did. They were there. Verse 22 says, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the, the son of a valiant man from Kebzeel, who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He had also gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian, a man of great height, five cubits, uh, seven, seven and a half feet tall. In the Egyptian's hand was, there was a spear like the weaver's beam. And he went down with him with the staff and wrestled the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and, and killed him with his own spear. This was the content or the character these, these, of these mighty men. And verses 26 through 47 list them all by name. And I'm not going to go and read all them because they're names that I cannot pronounce. But what I want you to notice is verse 41. We're going to come back to that, but verse 41, it says Uriah the Hittite was part of this group, this group of mighty men that, that was with David through thick and thin, that was there wanting him to become king, was backing him 100% with their lives. And it brings us, this brings us now to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And it happened in the spring of the year, at a time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Amnon and besieged Reba. But David remained at Jerusalem. All right, now we're setting the stage here to this next key point in, in David's life. And it says there that David, in this season when the kings go out to fight each other, I guess there was a season for that. It must not have been great when um, it was wintry or something. They don't want to go out and fight. But springtime, hey, that's the time to fight. And notice it said that kings go out. The time that kings go out. Well, did the king go out? No, it didn't. He said that he stayed there in the comfort of his home. He had had a home built for him, a nice wood home, and he was living in luxury. And rightfully so, right? He had been chased by Saul for 15 years. And what did he have to show for it? Well, now he's king. He showed him, and now he can have some time to not go out and fight. That'd be easy to justify, wouldn't it? So Joab is there fighting for him and willing to do so. And David here, he's there at home while his men are off fighting. Verse 2, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. That first word, then, that started with, this is kind of like Bate. Now, this is what's happening. Changes everything. Changes everything in the story, doesn't it? And you know what's coming up. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold, to look at. And so David is here. He, he can't sleep one night or it's, dusk, I'm not exactly sure, but he gets up and, and walks around the roof of his house. And he looks over and he sees his neighbor there taking a bath. Generally, when you're taking a bath, you, you're not wearing all your clothes. And he says, wow, this is the first mistake. He should have said, man, that's not what I should be seeing and go back into his house. But, but he doesn't. He doesn't do that. Notice what he does. He says, So David 
inquired about the woman. Who is it? He doesn't even know who his neighbors are. He's so worried, you know, so caught up in what his stuff is all about. He doesn't know who his neighbors are. This is when he should have paused and said, you know, that's not where my eyes are going to continue to go. That's not what I'm invited to see. And you know what? He had wives already, didn't he? But he says, wow, that's beautiful. That's okay. You can see beauty. But it should have stopped there. So David sent and inquired about the woman. So in order to inquire about the woman, you have to ask people, who is that? And someone said, doesn't say who, and someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now remember, we just read earlier that Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men. He was, he was so close to David that he was his neighbor. Was this an important person? Yes. Someone that had devoted his life to, to protecting David. And so that next thing that comes across David's mind should have been, oh, that's Uriah's wife. That's not where my mind needs to go. Yes, she's beautiful. Good for you, Uriah. You, I'm happy for you. He should have paused there and stopped and turned around the other way. But he asked everyone, who is this? So who knows about it that he's asking? Well, someone does. Verse 4 says, Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him. It says there that David summoned this lady, this beautiful lady Bathsheba. And so she came. You, you, you do what the king commands, right? Would he, she have come for anyone else? Probably not. And so David is using his, his position, his power and authority to, to summon this person. And she comes. And then what does he do, it says? It says there that he took her. This is a force of action, and she came to him, and he lay with her, slept with her, had sex with her. Using his position and authority, for she was cleansed for, from her impurity, she washed up, and she returned to her house. It could have been left there, but this act, this very intimate act, this betrayal of, of relationship with him and his, his mighty man of Uriah the Hittite, things got complicated. Verse 5 says, and the woman conceived. Now she's got a problem. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. This is complicated. Now there's a problem. She's pregnant, but it's not Uriah's. And so David's got a problem. What does he do? People know about this. Remember, he, he asked, who is that pretty lady over there that's bathing and they said, it's Uriah's, the Hittite's wife, Bathsheba. People knew what David did. He had sent for her to come to his house. This is something that people knew about. It wasn't done in secret. But it wasn't just a meeting. She's now pregnant. And so Bathsheba holds him accountable for his, for his actions. Then David sent to Joab, he says, I've got to figure this out, sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. He was off fighting for David. And Joab sent 
Uriah to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king's followed him. David says, hey, I, I know what I'll do. I'll bring him back. And, and he beats around the bush and has pleasantries. And he says, go home. Wash your feet. Get ready. And he goes there. Verse 9 says, but, this changes things, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. This is a problem. See, what is David trying to do? He's trying to cover this up. So when they told David this saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, the servants knew what had happened. They knew what he was trying to do. David said, go down to Uriah and said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Notice what Uriah says. And Uriah said to David, the ark of Israel and Judah are dwelling in in tents. And my lord, Joab, the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. His soldiers open the fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and, and lie with my wife? And David's saying, yes, you should, because it would get me out of a mess. As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing, Uriah says. Notice what was living in tent still. Not only Israel, but the ark. The ark of Israel, the, the, this presence of God, it wasn't in a temple yet. It was just in a tent. But yet David had a house. And so he says, you know, I'm not going to do this thing out of principle. Then, you, then David said to Uriah, wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. He says, you know what? I know a way. When someone is drunk, when they've drinking too much wine or strong drink or alcohol, their, their mind ceases to work the way it should. And so maybe if I can do that, then he'll go back home and sleep with his, his wife. Hmm. But this didn't work either. It says there that he made him drunk. At evening he went down to lie about on his bed with his servants, his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So even when he's drunk, he says, no, I'm not gonna. Verse 14, in the morning as it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Notice this. Uriah goes back to battle and he takes this letter and he wrote the letter saying, Set Uriah in the front of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So Uriah takes this letter, doesn't open it, assumedly, brings it to Joab, his own death sentence. Wow. When David was writing that, I'm sure he should have paused and said, you know, this is not right. But he doesn't. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Did you catch that? It wasn't just David that went along with this, this plan, but Joab too. He didn't question it. He just said, you know what? He's got to go. 
Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger saying, when you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath arises. And he says to you, why did you approach so near the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerabuseleth? Something like that. Was not a woman who was it not a woman who cast a piece of a millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So even Joab is trying to make up a story to some degree of, of why this has happened. And so the messenger went. Went and came and told David that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field, and we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. And the archers shot from the wall at your servants. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah, the Hittite, is dead also. And so David must think, hey, I've won here. No one knows about it. It was just something that happened in battle. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, notice this, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. And so David says, you know, don't let this thing bother you. You know, it's just, someone's going to die by the sword. It's war, it's battle. It doesn't matter. But Joab knew something had gone on. This is why he's saying to just essentially cover it up. David had many chances to make things right. But he doesn't. The power and position that he thought he had, the rights that he thought he had to the throne, the very things that, that Saul was doing that disqualified him to be king, David was doing here. Verse 26, Then when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. We're going to get to that next week. Why did this thing displease the Lord? This wasn't the first time a Bible character up until this point had had more than one wife. What was it about it? I don't think this was God's ideal to have more than one wife. I mean, we see this clearly in, in Genesis. But what was it? Well, it was this using this power and position and authority to coerce and force his way. The way that he thought he had right to. To take something that wasn't his. And so that's not the way God works. Now God could just snap his fingers and make things happen, but he wants us to make the decision to follow him. He could put a gun to our head and just say, if you don't follow me, I'm going to zap you. But he doesn't. He doesn't use his, his power and position and authority that he rightfully has. He is the king of the universe. He doesn't use that in a way to force us to do things, to make him happy. Like this, this act that David did with Bathsheba, did this make him happy? No, it just made a mess of things. 
something that had intended, God intended to be intimate and special, he had, had made a problem and something to be dreaded by Bathsheba. A problem. A moral conundrum, if you would. What do you do? And so I think we need to be very careful how we use our position. We have position, don't we? Everyone has position, whether it's in their own family or in their job or in their friendships or even in church. How are we using these, this position? Are we using it for the good of others or are we using it to force and get our way? God's way isn't a way of force. It isn't a way of coercion, of forcing love. That's not God's way. He says, come to me. Come to me. Repent. Come to me. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. And so that's what I was thinking about today with this, this passage is about David. And, and, it's, a, and it's a hard thing. We think of David as this great person, David and Goliath, but then we have this fall. And I think these things are written for our example of what not to do, what to do and what not to do in life. And so God gives us this. He gives us this charge. Don't use your power and position and authority to force and manipulate. But use the love of God to attract and share. Let's pray. God, as we have learned from David's life, what not to do. I pray that we can heed the warning that is here. And in the next chapter, we get to the next part of the story. Be with us as we explore that next week. In your name, amen. Hey guys, thanks so much. Um, Have a blessed week. And uh, come back again next week for the next and last part of this story. Have a good week.